you're ready to play some multiplayer. So to go to the back groups, you look at divisions in there. That's that's a lot of divisions to pick from. I mean, like, what what infantry do I take? Oh, how how many supply trucks do I I need? What the hell does an artillerist do? Right, well, this guide is here to help you to build your very first steel division too. Division. I do want to know, yeah, everything I'm about to say, there will be exceptions to you, so when building your own division, just remember to use a little bit of common sense, as a lot of them do vary drastically when it comes to unit composition. But uh, nonetheless, let's get right to it. The first thing is picking your division. I'd highly recommend if you're brand new to this sort of game, is that you stick through a bunch of A-rated divisions for your first rather of the game. They're the most flexible out of the other divisions, and usually have better offensive power, as are uh, usually mechanized or tank divisions. If you're really having a hard time picking, I'd recommend either 5th Panzer for the Germans, or 2nd Guard Tank Corps for the Russians. First thing you're going to want to figure out when creating your new division is what income you are going to take, as it's going to determine when you're going to get the majority of units in what phase. For example, if you choose a Maverick income, you have a lot of points in B phase, so you're going to want to get a lot of units in B phase to exploit that factor. If you really have no idea of what sort of units or what phase you should be taking them, you can't really go too wrong taking a balance income at the start and then adjust accordingly. So in the recon tab, the first thing is you should always have at least one card of recon infantry. Recon infantry are rather nice because you can hide them in forests and they usually have very good optics. I personally prefer taking the two band recon squads. Yes, they have less firepower compared to the larger counterparts. But really, recon's there to just spot stuff, not fight. Also, the two-man squads, you usually have some rather nice infantry transport options, which also have recon optics, so it's a two-and-run bonus. You are going to take recon vehicles, which I would recommend if you're playing more of a mobile division, especially with a lot of tanks. I highly recommend taking armoured vehicles over than unarmoured counterparts. The reason being is, armoured vehicles can't get shot up by infantry machine guns, which means you survive much more which is rather beneficial. And considering that with vehicles you can't hide them as well as infantry, you're probably gonna get shot at more often. Number one rule for infantry is always take the fastest transport possible. The reason being is you need your infantry at the front line now rather than later. Usually in this case for the Germans it's the Opel Blitz and for the Russians it's the Studebaker. Sometimes when you're selecting infantry units, it will default the transport to something rather slow, such as the ZIS-42, and honestly, you don't want that. Yo, this rule doesn't really matter if you're focusing on getting half-track vehicles, like the 2-5 run for example. Secondly, is you always want a healthy amount of CQC infantry that are really important to have, such as Stern Pioneers or after Machiki. The reason being is they're the most effective way to fight over forest or in towns, as they just completely decimate anything nearby with their overwhelming firepower. So always try to have a good handful of these troops. I want to try to take some infantry that have anti-tank capabilities, preferably something like a Panzerfaust or PTRD anti-tank rifle. As Raoul, we can usually sneak up and tanks pretty effectively with infantry. And surprise, surprise, you can get some pretty good kills, even with just an AT rifle. The first rule of tanks is you want to bring some of the hardest hitting tanks that you can, always. The reason being is there's quite a lot of open areas in SD2, and having something with a lot of armor and a big gun hold open at open area is usually pretty beneficial. Also take in consideration that some of your harder hitting tanks may actually be in the anti-tank tab, so please keep that in mind. Apart from that, tanks are honestly pretty straightforward. You always want to take some medium cost tanks, and pretty much every division always has them, such as Panzer IVs, T-34s, Stugs, etc. As their general all-purpose, and they're usually pretty good in the majority of situations. Also, if you do take light tanks, such as Panzer II Luxes or anything in the Hungarian Cavalry Division, I'd usually recommend taking them with the lowest veterancy possible, as you're usually just using them for more infantry fire support, and so really quantity is really a quality of its own in that regard. Support? Always, always, always have an E-phase supply truck. The reason being is if one of your call artillery units run out of ammo, or if your tank gets decrewed, you don't want to have to wait around till B-phase to fix it, you're gonna want to fix it now. 
And speaking of supply trucks, I'd always recommend a bead phase supply truck as well. I usually find this to be more than enough in most situations with most divisions, unless you're spamming a lot of artillery, and you're probably going to want more, as artillery drains supply trucks the most. You want to take this time to talk about leaders, as leader units are extremely important. You usually get them either in the infantry tab, the tank tab, or the artillery tab. Now the reason you want leaders is that they buff your nearby units with an extra plus one veterancy, which is pretty good, and they also stop units within their aura from being surrendered. Now how many leaders you want to take, I'd usually recommend having at least a dozen leader units or so, and which ones you take really depends on your divisions. If you play in a more tank division with a lot of tank slots, take t more tank leaders. Infantry division, more infantry leaders. I do always recommend taking one card of artillery leaders, as they're usually pretty cost efficient and a rather big, beefy squad. This brings us over to commanders, who you get in the support tab. Essentially, commanders are super leaders. They set up a command chain between all the other leaders, and any leader within this command chain gives plus two veterancy bonuses over the regular plus one. In terms of commander choices, I'd usually recommend taking an infantry commander, as you can get him in A phase. You can also hide him in a forest, and you may be thinking, well, they're not mobile. Well, if you take an armed transport, such as a half-track, you can just put them back in the half-track, move them to a different position, and you're good as new. Make sure your commander doesn't die. In terms die. of support units that can actually fight, you're really going to be picking them depending on your infantry weaknesses. If you like CQC infantry, for example, you'll probably want to take some flamethrower or 50mm mortar scrotch. And if you're lacking long range anti infantry potential, machine gun teams are good. You also got infantry support guns, as well as infantry support tanks. For the AT tab, the one major rule you should always follow is bring some of the hardest hitting AT guns or tank destroyers that you can, for the same reason in the tank tab, to crack open heavy tanks and to hold open open areas. Apart from that, your anti-tank tab is pretty reliant on how your tank tab is already set up. If you already have a lot of tanks and you're confident in that anti-tank ability, yeah, maybe just get an AT gun or two, you really don't need to worry all that much. However, if you don't have a lot of tanks, then of course you're going to want to take a lot of tank destroyers and anti-tank guns to try and compensate. And if you have a spare slot or two, a Panzer Shrek or an anti-tank rifle squad is never a terrible option. They definitely feel more tertiary as they do lack the range potential as the other anti-tank units. But when a Panzer Strike hits something, that thing is usually dead. For anti air, the first thing is if you have mobile anti air units, I'd recommend them over the static anti air units, as you can move them around and stop them from being counter battery. Apart from that, however, you do want to try to take some mid caliber anti air guns, such as 37 or 40mm, for example, as they usually have a pretty good trade off between range and rate of fire. They're pretty much your jack of all trade of AA units. With artillery, you always want to try to take mobile artillery units over their static counterparts as you can move them around and it'll stop them from being counter batteried and they usually have some armor so they survive the counter battery much better. For the most part artillery observers aren't really a rough raw unit to take. The reason being is that for the Germans a lot of your leaders already have radios on them so you're already going to get a corrected shot bonus and for the Russians a lot of your artillery units don't even have radios so there's not really much of a point. And honestly, you could just take enough for artillery units that actually has firepower potential. And lastly, always try to bring artillery which has some smoke capabilities. For the most part, they do, which is pretty useful. But smoke is an extremely useful tool in this game, as they can be used on the offense, it can be used on the defense. Just smoke everything, it's great. Your air tab, always, always, always bring fighters at least one to two cards worth, even if you have a lot of anti air, as fighters are the most effective way of shooting down enemy aircraft. And in terms of picking close air support planes, it really depends on what your ground game weakness is. If you don't have a lot of ground based AT, you're probably going to want to take cluster bombers or anti tank gun planes for example. If you don't have a lot of artillery, you're probably going to want a lot of high explosive bombers. It really depends on the rest of your division setup. And also do not underestimate taking recon planes, even though they don't have direct impact on the game in terms of blowing stuff up. They have incredible spotting potential and can pretty easily spot enemy artillery parks so you can counter battery them. If you are going to take recon planes, try to take the fastest runs that you can unvetted so you have as much of them as you possibly can in just one card. In terms of defenses, barbed wire is always a good choice as it slows down enemy units. 
Trenches are also pretty good, especially in open ground areas where there's no cover for your infantry, but I don't find you need to get a lot of trenches, usually one card is more than enough. Often that, just try to take a healthy amount of bunkers, such as machine gun or anti-tank bunkers. Once you're done building your division, you'll probably want to figure out if it's good or not, and really the best way to do this is honestly just to play some matches with it. Whether you're win or lose, that doesn't really matter. You're going to probably head back to the battle group screen and make changes to your division accordingly. You're probably going to do this for the first few matches or so until you figure out a sort of battle group composition that fits your playstyle. That's a general guide in building divisions in Steel Division 2. I hope for the new players watching this you have found this rather helpful in guiding you in the right direction in building a good Steel Division 2 battle group. So, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. As usual, please just take it easy.